Welcome back to Uncharted X. My name is Ben, and this video is a continuation of my series looking at the evidence for lost ancient high technology. This one is an interesting tale, and one I've been meaning to tell for quite some time. I originally thought it was going to be a short video, as if I could ever manage to make one of those, but the further I researched, the deeper the rabbit hole went, and I hope you'll enjoy exploring its depths with me. In this episode, I want to explore a couple of the unique features of ancient Egyptian Old Kingdom pyramid sites. Features that are clearly indicative for the use of advanced technology in their creation, which today leave us some tantalizing hints as to functionality and purpose. Certainly well beyond the ceremonial or religious label attached by mainstream archaeology to everything that comes from this period. What I'm referring to here is the use of hard basalt stone to create pavements in the structures around specific Old Kingdom pyramid sites. There are several well-known examples of these polished and remarkably flat floors, and wherever they're found, you don't have to look very far for the evidence of machining and advanced forms of stone cutting. Around and on such basalt floors are cutting marks and tool signatures that are quite distinctive and very different to those made by the primitive and simple hand tools that we know the dynastic Egyptians utilised. In fact, these machining and tool marks seem to indicate the use of very large and even powered machines. They've been a fascination of mine for many years now, and have been investigated and analysed by the likes of Sir Flinders Petrie, Christopher Dunn, and several more mainstream contemporary Egyptologists, and to this day their manufacture and purpose remains both a debate and a mystery. In addition to these basalt floors, Old Kingdom sites have another unique feature, the installation of channelled blocks that run beneath the flooring level of the structures and causeways that surround the pyramids. Indeed, there is evidence for what seems to have been an entire infrastructure of these channels in a subfloor level, which is a very strange feature, if you believe them to have been purely ceremonial temples. Given that they're hidden from sight, below several feet of stone pavement, what ceremonial purpose could these channelled blocks possibly serve? Their existence screams functionality, and when pressed, mainstream Egyptology has described them as a sewer system. But does this look like an appropriate outlet for a sewer? Why would you make a sewer system from incredibly hard stone like quartzite, or from the much sought after white alabaster, or even granite like this channelled block at Giza? All of these are stone types that have to be transported tremendous distances from their quarries to where we find them today. Safe to say that I have a different perspective on these features of Old Kingdom sites, and I hope you'll join me as we investigate these rarely discussed mysteries of some of the most ancient structures found anywhere on planet Earth. We begin with the basalt floors, the most famous example being, of course, the large basalt pavement to the east of the Great Pyramid at Giza. Most often used as a convenient resting spot for tourists, vendors and camels. While most people just sit on this pavement, staring up at the pyramid, a close inspection of the blocks that form it will reveal a large number of plunge cuts, saw cuts, machining marks and other evidence for advanced stone cutting that cannot be explained by the tools and techniques attributed to the ancient Egyptians. Before we take a closer look at this aspect of the pavement, let's first understand what the material is that we're talking about. Around 90% of the volcanic stone on Earth is basalt, an igneous rock, meaning it was formed with great heat, that may also be plutonic, meaning some types of basalt may have cooled and then hardened underground. As with many other stone types, granite being an example, its common name can cover several different varieties, and basalt is no different. Without delving into the specific geochemistry, the stone that we see at Giza and the other Old Kingdom locations could also be said to be forms of diabase or dolerite, and most basalt is very similar to andesite in composition, distinguished only by its specific percentage of silica. The average density of basalt is actually greater than that of granite, making it a heavier stone to work, and as it's even harder than granite, it's just as challenging, if not more so, to cut and shape. In fact, the very name basalt is a derivative of the Latin basanites, meaning very hard stone. Its specific hardness can vary, but basalt is commonly a 7 or even an 8 on the Mohs scale of hardness. As mentioned, it's harder than granite, and it will easily scratch glass or even steel. Let's just assume that this is a very difficult choice of stone to do stonework in, particularly if you're some poor loincloth wearing punter with a flint chisel and a copper bar working out in the Egyptian sunshine. It's not only beside the Great Pyramid that we can find evidence of basalt in ancient structures. 
We also find such basalt floors at the Old Kingdom site of Abu Sir, at the Sahure, Nefakare and Nusara complexes. They are also found at nearby Saqqara, with a large basalt pavement and causeway discovered in the Yusakaf complex. And interestingly, basalt paving blocks were also discovered in the Great Pit below the Steppe Pyramid of Djosa, a structure that I've explored in some detail in a recent video. The link to that is below. As mentioned, the only significant use of basalt left at Giza today is the pavement that's next to the Great Pyramid, but this is far from the only use of basalt at this site. There were historical reports of basalt being used in the upper or pyramid temple of the middle pyramid complex, said to have been that of Pharaoh Khafra, although this cannot be confirmed as there is really no trace of basalt left here in evidence today. The Great Box, or the so-called sarcophagus of the Third Pyramid, attributed to Menkara, was also made from a single piece of basalt, and weighed in at around 3 tonnes. It was discovered by Howard Weiss when he dynamited his way into the Third Pyramid in 1837. Weiss removed the basalt box from the structure and sent it back to England, on board a merchant ship called the Beatrice. The Beatrice, though, never arrived in England, as on around October 13th of 1838, she encountered a storm in the Mediterranean and sank, bearing her ancient treasure with her to the bottom of the ocean and has yet to be found. There was a considerable amount of other antiquities from Egypt on board, along with the priceless stone box, and the Beatrice is but one of the many ships loaded with the treasure of ancient Egypt to be lost at sea. At the very least, a number of massive granite obelisks are also currently lying at the bottom of the ocean, thanks to shipwrecks and the nature of man. What I find particularly remarkable about the ancients' use of basalt is that it was only something that seems to have been done in the earliest parts of the Old Kingdom, and this is something even acknowledged by mainstream Egyptology. From the perspective of said mainstream history, it's a mystery as to why the use of basalt is not something that we see in later periods, or anything beyond structures attributed to the 6th dynasty. Further, it's long been a puzzle for Egyptologists as to exactly why this difficult stone was used in Old Kingdom architecture, given its intractable nature. Of course, any such explanation for this simply must be framed within the ceremonial slash religious temple perspective that Egyptologists classify all such architecture within. It's not like the theology, rituals, or culture of ancient dynastic Egypt drastically changed beyond this early period. So why do we only see these remarkable machined pavements in the oldest of pyramid complexes? In 1993, James K. Hofmeyer authored a paper published in the Journal of the American Research Center in Egypt looking at this specific element of ancient sites. It was titled, The Use of Basalt in Floors in Old Kingdom Pyramid Temples. Quoting from Hofmeyer's paper, Quote, Over the years there has been considerable scholarly discussion devoted to the function of the various structures of Old Kingdom pyramid complexes. The explanations offered for the purpose of the valley or lower temple and the funerary or upper temple have found little consensus. What I should like to do is examine one feature of the funerary complex which has been recognised by scholars but has not been taken into account when formulating theories on the function of the lower and upper temples. Basalt has been found as flooring in a number of upper temples but suggestions to explain its presence are lacking. Three basalt paving blocks were discovered by C.M. Firth and J.E. Quibble in the Great Pit of the Steppe Pyramid at Saqqara, but this may not have been their original locus. At Giza, virtually all that remains of the funeral temple of Khufu is the floor which is made of basalt. Firth's clearing of the pyramid complex of Yusakaf at Saqqara in 1928-29 revealed a basalt pavement in the open court of the upper temple, measuring 35 by 21 metres. Connected to this on the south side of the sanctuary were two chambers on either side of the six-pillared niche that were paved with black basalt. On the east side of the pyramid, Firth uncovered a chamber that he called a small offering place, which likewise had a basalt floor. And... Finally, the causeway was also covered with basalt. Parts of the upper temples of Sahure, Nefekare and Nusara at Abu Sir also have basalt pavements. Not much of it remains in situ in Sahure's temple. That of Nusara, however, is quite well preserved. Beyond the 6th dynasty, no further examples of basalt pavements in funerary establishments can be cited. According to Dieter Arnold, there are no traces of basalt pavements in the 12th dynasty pyramid complexes at Lisht and Dashur, where he has investigated. 
In general, the use of basalt was limited after the Old Kingdom, concludes J.R. Harris in his study of the lexicography of Egyptian minerals. Thus, it appears that the use of basalt in funerary structures is restricted to the Old Kingdom and in the Saqqara, Abu Sia, and Giza necropolises. End quote. Hofmeyer goes on to discuss the potential quarry locations as a source for this basalt, which most likely came from an area just north of the Fayum, a well-known depression to the west of the Nile and around 60 kilometres south of Giza. Still visible on satellite imagery today is this green leaf-shaped agricultural zone. I've discussed the Fayum in several videos, as it's home to many ancient sites, including Hawara and the famed Lost Labyrinth of ancient Egypt. An ancient basalt quarry was discovered here in 1987, at a place called Widan el Faras, and there are even remnants of an ancient road, partly paved in basalt, leading south towards Lake Moris. Further quoting Hofmeyer's paper, quote, the distance between this new quarry and the necropolises of Giza, 58 kilometres, and Saqqara, 61 kilometres, is not that great when compared with the distance required for shipping granite from Aswan. However, it was a considerable undertaking to quarry the hard stone and transport it to Giza. Besides this consideration, the complexity of installing a basalt pavement, which involved sawing and pounding the blocks into shape, must also be considered. This factor forces one to ask, why go to the additional trouble and expense of bringing basalt for paving Khufu's upper temple floor, rather than using local material, or even the bedrock? End quote. Why indeed? And why is there evidence on this basalt of far more than simple sawing or pounding? Hofmeyer does go on to speculate for a ceremonial religious purpose for the basalt pavements in his paper, but does not concern himself further with any analysis or investigation into how they were manufactured. For this, we must turn to a couple of my favourite figures in the field of ancient engineering and manufacturing, both historical and contemporary, Flinders Petrie and Christopher Dunn. Along with the tubular drills and evidence for lathe-worked stone vessels, both topics that I've discussed at length in other videos, Flinders Petrie also discussed the evidence for circular saw use and machining of hard stone in his excellent book The Pyramids and Temples of Giza, published first in 1883. He cites several examples and collected fragments of cut basalt from the pavement to the east of the Great Pyramid. Quoting the great Sir William Flinders Petrie, quote, The examples of saw cuts figured in Plate 14 are as follows. Number 1, from the end of the Great Pyramid coffer of granite, showing where the saw cut was run too deep into the stuff twice over and backed out again. Number 2, a piece of cyanide picked up at Memphis, showing cuts on four faces of it, and the breadth of the saw by a cut across the top of it. This probably was a waste piece from cutting out a statue in the rough. Number three, a piece of basalt showing a saw cut run askew and abandoned, with the sawing dust and sand left in it, a fragment from the sawing of the great basalt pavement on the east of the Great Pyramid. Number four, another piece from the same pavement, showing regular and well-defined lines. Number five, a slice of basalt from the same place, sawn on both sides and nearly sawn in two. Number six, a slice of diorite bearing equidistant and regular grooves of circular arcs, parallel to one another. These grooves have been nearly polished out by cross grinding, but still are visible. The only feasible explanation of this piece is that it was produced by a circular saw. The main examples of sawing at Giza are the blocks of the Great Basalt Pavement and the coffers of the Great second and third pyramids, the latter unhappily now lost. End quote. Petrie, both in his book and in his later letters and addresses to the Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland, distinguishes the method used to make these marks on these examples against those left by grinding techniques using quartz sand or other abrasives, which is the technique asserted by mainstream Egyptology today to have been the only possible method of ancient Egyptian stone cutting. Petrie states numerous times that these examples are the results of stone cutting, likely with a fixed point of an unknown material that is nonetheless much harder than the granite or basalt, and not the result of grinding. Not only that, but note Petrie's mention of a circular saw, which is definitely not something supposed to have been in the ancient Egyptians' toolbox. We'll come back around to circular saws shortly. The difference between grinding through stone and cutting it is an important point because this is where the debate, such as it is, still lies today, some 150 years later. 
engineer and precision manufacturing expert Christopher Dunn, in his excellent book, Lost Technologies of Ancient Egypt, furthered the work of Petrie with his analysis of the evidence for advanced stone cutting into basalt and granite. As you can see in this footage, the basalt pavement mentioned by Petrie is full of such examples. And although Petrie only mentions three of them, there are at least a dozen different blocks here with all sorts of marks still left on them. From plunge cuts where a blade has been dipped into the material and then backed out, to the striations left from multiple cuts on the sides of these blocks as their edges were shaved or worked. Most of these cut marks are from the sides of the blocks, and would not normally have been visible if the pavement was intact, but as it has been left in a state of ruin over the millennia, the sides of the blocks and their markings are now visible. Most of these marks are likely the result of a multi-step process, from the roughing out of the block, the fitting and shaving of it on site, and its ultimate precision fit and polished top surface as part of the overall pavement. I say likely, as although there is much to learn and analyse from these marks, it's difficult to ever be certain as to exactly how or why they were made. Quoting Christopher Dunn, quote, Without going back in time and talking to the pyramid builder, it is impossible to explain every anomalous action that created the complex variety of evidence on the basalt pavement. Considering that the now exposed blocks that reveal these saw cuts were originally covered by adjacent blocks, it is not unreasonable to speculate that the sawed parts of the blocks were given a quick shave in order to remove irregularities that were inherent in the quarrying process, and were holding one block apart from its neighbour. If we consider the overall roughness of the blocks, this quick shave was more than likely given by the only tools available on the site, and they were the tools used for finishing and cutting to size all of the blocks that went into building the pyramid. It is well known that these blocks are extremely precise in their cutting, especially those that make up the walls of the inner chambers and also the casing blocks, assuming they were all of the same exactness as the few that survive. It could be argued, therefore, that the roughing tools were not on the plateau, but were applied elsewhere. End quote. What is undeniable here is that these marks, replete with striations, are the result of some form of sawing or grinding, and not the result of pounding stones, flint or copper chisels, which are the tools so often quoted as the primary methods of ancient Egyptian stonework. It's here that mainstream archaeology gets itself into something of a pickle, as these marks found not only on the basalt blocks of the pavement, but as Petrie described also on the boxes or sarcophagi in the pyramids and on large granite slabs, have to be explained by other methods. An attempt at explaining them was made by Robert G. Moores Jr. in an article titled Evidence for Use of a Stone-Cutting Drag Saw by the Fourth Dynasty Egyptians, published in 1991 in the Journal of the American Research Center in Egypt. Although this is a firmly mainstream Egyptology attempt at explaining these marks, with Moore's proposed solution of this drag saw, he had no alternative but to state that, quote, the degree of mechanization indicated by this operation is somewhat more advanced than general views of the pyramid builder's technology level now hold, and also that the sawing done in this place represents a sophisticated operation of a mature industry, end quote. Chris Dunn made a thorough analysis of Moore's proposed solution, and it is in this analysis that we can begin to see just how weak the mainstream case is for some form of relatively primitive grinding technique to explain the evidence written in the stone. First, let's describe what Moore proposed, quoting Christopher Dunn. Quote, Moore's proposes a blade made of copper with a notched leading edge. The blade was 157 inches 4 meters long and 23.6 inches 60 centimeters broad, and was wedge-shaped from 0.393 inch 1 cm at the top to 0.118 inches or 3 mm at the cutting edge. Moores estimates the weight of the blade was 308 pounds or 140 kilograms. Quartz sand was used in the process as an abrasive. It was rubbed against the basalt both as a loose medium and also by quartz sand that was embedded into the copper. This process, with fresh sand being added to the cut as used sand and sawed rock was flushed away, impressed the shape of the blade into the basalt. As we see in the figure, a team of workers dragged a blade across a block that was fixed inside a trench filled with water. The blade was suspended on ropes that were controlled by workers, who, according to Moores, managed the blade's incremental descent into the basalt. End quote. Just with this description of the blade and the image of its theoretical operation, you can begin to imagine some of the practical mechanical problems with this proposed solution. 
And this is only the beginning of the issues with the mainstream explanation. Quote, It is hard to imagine the successful employment of the physics of a pendulum on a swinging 308-pound object that ultimately is met with a hard, solid surface covered in sand. If we take into consideration the fact that the blade is wedge-shaped, which would mean its increasing width would impede its progress into the slot, the impossibility of the operation becomes more evident. End quote. Where it gets truly ridiculous is with Moore's claimed rate of cutting with such a setup. Admittedly, he does state that this is the best case estimate, but according to his paper, a single cycle of this saw, one back and forth motion, would cut 2 millimeters into the basalt. And with a swing time of around 2.84 seconds, it would cut at a rate of 42 millimeters or 1.653 inches per minute. Let's put some of these rates into context. As explained by Chris Dunn, United States patent number 7082939 filed in 2003 describes an improved frame saw using carbon alloy steel blades impregnated with diamonds and cites a downfeed rate into granite of 30 millimeters or 1.18 inches, not per minute, but per hour. This modern rate of granite cutting using powered saws with diamond tip blades is 84 times less than the rate cited by Moore with his copper drag saw using sand and human power. Like I said, it's truly ridiculous. And bear in mind here that we're also comparing the modern rate of cutting into granite, while Moore is citing a rate of cutting into basalt, which is harder and therefore even more difficult to cut than granite. The fun doesn't stop here either, because we do have some indication of just how long it takes to cut granite using a drag saw. Experimental archaeologist Dennis Stocks, who I've mentioned on this channel in my previous videos on tubular drills, has experimented with human-powered copper saws using sand to grind through granite. Although I do think that Mr. Stocks does ignore some of the evidence in the stonework and conducts his experiments with a very specific outcome in mind, I do want to say that this sort of testing is a very good thing and should be applauded, as ultimately this sort of data should help us to get closer to the truth. In 1999, Stocks tested a much smaller setup of this drag saw, with a blade 1.8 meters or 5.9 feet long, 15 centimeters or 5.9 inches deep, and 6 millimeters or 0.236 inches thick. It weighed in at 14.5 kilos, or 32 pounds, and was further assisted by stone weights on each end, adding another 45 kilograms, or 99 pounds, to the blade. Using both dry and wet sand, I've done it dry, I've done it wet, and the wet is much better. And cutting different lengths in granite between 2 and 3 feet long, these were the observations and results from Dennis Stock's test. Firstly, a hand-powered saw advances more slowly into the granite over a longer cut than it does into a shorter one. I'll illustrate why this is important shortly, but in general, the actual rate of granite removal stays the same. His results varied between 0.105 and 0.084 inches per hour, around 2.1 to 2.7 millimeters per hour feed rate into the granite. A far cry from Moore's 42 millimeters per minute, and some 14 times less than the rate quoted by our modern diamond-tipped frame saw example. Also worthy of note here is that the copper of the blade is ground away by the sand, just like the granite, and Stocks reported losing nearly half a kilogram of copper from his blade over 14 hours of use. Using these material removal rates, Chris Dunn estimated how long it might have taken to simply rough out the granite box that is found inside the middle pyramid, the so-called sarcophagus attributed to Khafra. We're not talking about the finishing or polishing of the box, nor about hollowing it out and forming the internal surfaces and corners. This is purely making the six basic cuts to shape the box, the top and bottom, and the north, south, east, and west faces. Based on Dennis Stock's result, it would have taken some 6,270 hours of grinding with a copper bar to make these cuts. As you can see here, we achieved this in just a few days. That's more than 261 days of 24 hours a day, non-stop work, just to get the basic shape of the box completed. And there's probably far more work involved in hollowing it out, finishing it, and then polishing it after that step. This is where it gets really fun, 
With all that we've now established about the orthodox view of ancient and primitive stone cutting, let's now consider the literal hundreds of thousands of tons of Old Kingdom granite across all of these ancient sites. Most all of it is precision cut and finished. The entire bottom course of the Middle Pyramid is cased in granite, and there are hundreds of large blocks of granite in this example alone. At the other end of the causeway is the mighty Valley Temple, which is made from blocks of granite and diorite, some of them up to 70 tons, as was the original Upper or Pyramid Temple, as were countless other structures, which have now all been quarried and gone. The Basalt Pavement to the east of the Great Pyramid. the huge 70-ton granite beams in the Great Pyramid's upper chamber. The likewise huge and precision cut 70-ton blocks of the Assyrian structure in Upper Egypt. The granite casing stones of the Third Pyramid. The examples of large precision cut granite, basalt or diorite blocks are endless and all of them had to be hewn and sawed into their rough shape before then being precisely shaped down and fitted. Given the established rates of cutting and the methods described by Egyptologists, does this seem like a remotely reasonable proposition, given that each of them may have taken the best part of a year to cut by hand? Blocks alone aren't even close to all there is when it comes to granite either. You also have all of the massive single piece columns. The obelisks, the 400, 800 and 1000 ton statues, as well as the many single-piece stone boxes, not the least of which are the 24 huge and enigmatic boxes of the Serapium at Saqqara. Now don't hurt it. <laughs> yeah, it's fragile, obviously. Remember that according to mainstream experts like Dennis Stocks, the longer the cut, the slower the progress. Try to imagine the rough shaping of a Serapium box, some of which are more than 15 feet long. How long would it take to make this long axis cut on one of these boxes, and where do they get the time? Perhaps a better question is, where do they get the copper for all of this theoretical grinding? Recall that copper wears away at a prodigious rate as the stone is ground down. A single copper drag saw would be lucky to last even a full cut through something the size of your average 8 ton granite box. In the comments on my videos and in my emails, I all too often get the question of where are the tools when discussing the evidence for ancient machining. But this question could also be applied to the mainstream explanation. No copper saws of the type described by Moores have ever been found, and neither have the smaller yet still substantial type of drag saw that was used by Dennis Stocks in order to make his two to three feet long cuts in his experiments. There is another and perhaps even larger issue for the mainstream theory here also, and that is that the specific nature of the tool marks, the striations and cuts that we can observe on ancient basalt and granite, support an entirely more sophisticated solution than a simple flat bar drag saw that is grinding away at it with sand. In fact, some of these marks flat out disprove that a flat drag saw was the tool used to cut the stone. Remember in the earlier quote from Flinders Petrie, when he wrote that the only possible explanation for some of the markings was the use of a circular saw? Although the use of circular saws to cut stone in antiquity is summarily dismissed by mainstream Egyptology, including by Robert Morse in his paper proposing flat drag saws, they cannot cite any specific evidence for this dismissal, and they have no explanation for striations and marks such as these which are probably the very best example of circular saw use that I know of. This is a huge block of basalt at Abu Sir, nearly sawn all the way through, with consistent curved striations, 
and even a lip on the edge of the cut, which gives an indication of the width of the blade, only a few millimetres. It is obviously the product of a circular saw, and quite a big one at that. By extrapolating the curve, we can estimate the diameter of this saw could have been as large as 9 metres, or almost 30 feet. Try explaining this cut with your loincloth wearing stone pounding society. Many more circular striations and curved cuts can also be found at Abu Sia, and as Flinders Petrie mentioned, they're also found on the basalt pavement at Giza. Another notorious example of circular saw use is found on a particular slab of granite at the Old Kingdom site of Abu Rawash. Rarely visited, as it requires special permission to access, and I had the chance to visit this site in late 2020 for the first time. This is a remarkable piece of granite. When viewed from the top, it is quite obviously the result of a cut made with a circular saw. This piece gets far more complex, however, when you realise it is also concave, and has been cut with a consistent radius both horizontally and vertically likely the result of a multi-step process, as there is a kerf left from where one of the cuts was not quite finished. If we poured the water on this one, we wouldn't be able to see the striations. Huh? Anybody here that's yes. been working with power tool? Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. You see how this one here... The lip. Uh, yeah, this lip looks like a reflect of something that is really powerful. And these ones. Mm -hmm. So, this, in my opinion, Dr. Zaha Hawass is in the field. <laughs> 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 they didn't make this officially to be for tea, but we can reuse it to put the tea cup. <laughs> okay, so we can see the striations. Hmm? Clearly, the cut ended here, but we can see that it's not a, a flat surface. So, it, if this was part of a box, then this was an inside cut. You can imagine that this used to be another piece like that here or that the, it was quarried from something else, or it was even a corner, so it's an inner cut, which make it even hard to have a saw cutting this way. Hmm? Yeah. But on a smaller scale, I would see figures like this. If I using my six millimeter Dremel tool, uh, spinning like, uh, a cone shape, not a cone shape, but like a circular one that is a straight and I will be like, it will be rotating for example like that and I will be moving with it like will give very similar feathers this is, for me, is the closest the closest result on the stone yeah of course if you are familiar with the uh, research of uh, Christopher Dunn, so he believes the pit here we could be used for uh, a giant saw, but I don't really like the drawings because they put the piece of stone in the bottom of the pit. That would be a very hard challenge <laughs> to put the, the, the granite stone down there, but it will be more like if this disc is spinning and then the piece will be running that way while the disc spins this way up high, yeah. not underneath it. Mm. Yeah, he. Uh, so I think it's it's he's 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 suggests there was two cuts that were made. One that was cut it this way, and then one disc. If you can imagine it rotating this way and moving up here, that gives it that circular. Yes. Circular shape is dip, and then that's also where that cut ended here, or one of them. I agree but, with this part because this looks yeah like the, the spinning was running like yeah. this, this, and way. then moving this way. Yeah, yeah. we didn't move in that way. That was not real big. Hmm? Yes, we'll a little, uh, if you pour the water edge. on it, you, won't see it, you yeah. would never be able to see the striations. Oh, okay. But do you see the striations? Very fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would the skeptic say about this one? I understand the striations may show up when you do a bronze tube drill. 
Maybe they said that's a bit. Do they have any explanation for how you produce striations on a flat surface like this? You mean the academic story? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The academic story. Copper bar. They like, only imagine that it was a copper saw because yeah. they didn't show on the scenes on the walls of, the, of any dynasty mm -hmm. that they were using a saw to cut stone. <coughs> only woodwork. Mm. Even the piece. Oh, we have another guy. <laughs> Exactly how this blocks was shaped is a real puzzle, and I'll leave a further analysis of this piece for an upcoming video on Abu Rawash. But safe to say that the mainstream has no explanation for it, and as far as I know, has not even attempted to account for it within the primitive toolbox of the dynastic Egyptians. It should be noted that there is evidence for both straight saws and circular saws. Indeed, a variety of tools may have been used in the different stages of ancient stone processing. One of my favourite pieces that demonstrates several different saw marks, both straight and circular, is found tucked away in a corner at Abu Sia. It's a beautiful piece of high density quartzite, with just breathtaking colours that are revealed with a quick splash of water. This slab has been worked down to flat surfaces and seems to have been in the process of final shaping and shaving down, likely intended for a precision fit somewhere. We have fine tool marks on the edges of straight saws, just lightly touching the material, and then there is also evidence of deeper circular saw-like tools on its top surface. It's almost entirely cut through on its end and looks like it was broken or snapped from a larger piece. Seems like the type of block that should be subject to a deeper investigation from experts, but I'm just grateful that it's still here for us to look at and hasn't been carted off to gather dust in a storeroom somewhere. Chris Dunn has analysed the block at Abu Rawash, as well as the tool marks that are left at Giza in great detail, coming to the same conclusion as did Petrie, and he also commented on the mainstream's strange resistance to the idea of circular saws. Quoting Chris Dunn, quote, Before we return to Abu Rawash, we must resolve the differences between Petrie's observations and Moore's with respect to the use of circular saws. The evidence Moore's was looking at would certainly point to the use of straight saws, Yet there are other blocks on the pavement that pose a problem to the notion of the exclusive use of straight saws. Another block lies a short distance away from the pavement and would go unnoticed by the casual traveller unless he or she stumbled over it. That block can't be explained by the use of straight saws, because the surface is curved in a way that would eliminate the random arcing of a blade or any amount of uncontrolled meandering by a shaky operator. Figure 1024 contains three views of this basalt block that when viewed from the side at an angle, the saw cut seen in figure 1024A ends with a radius. Without examining the block further, it could be argued that a hand-operated straight saw created the cut and that the operators of the saw did not keep the saw straight as it moved through the cut, but instead allowed it to drift up and down. This is a common occurrence and, in fact, achieving a perfectly straight cut with a hand-powered saw is almost impossible. Fully impossible is the achievement of a concave radius for the obvious reason that it is physically impossible to create a saw cut where the entrance and exit points are higher than the middle with a flat edged straight saw. Some may argue that the saw could bend and create this condition and indeed they are more than welcome to prove their claim. Stocks did not observe this condition during his experiments and neither have I during my experience working with hand saws that were thinner than stocks. Along with Petrie's testimony to the use of circular saws at Giza, what we can gain from this block is further evidence that efficient circular tools were used on the Giza plateau, though we are still left to wonder about what they looked like, how they were driven, and from what material they were made. End quote. Dunn goes into far greater depth in his analysis, and if you're interested in reading further on these topics, and the many other undeniable proofs for the use of advanced technology in the architecture of ancient Egypt, I'd highly recommend picking up a copy of his book. So why is it that mainstream Egyptologists so steadfastly refuse to acknowledge this evidence? Indeed, much like in the case of the tilted photograph of Petrie's famous drill core number 7, they seem to be willing to go to any length in order to deny it, either by simply ignoring or dismissing evidence out of hand, or in some cases like this through obfuscation and logical fallacies, if not outright deception. I think this is because the implications of such evidence threaten the very foundations of the story of human civilization on this planet as we know it. 
This is the same story that the academics in their ivory towers with their tenure and their textbooks serve as its experts and high priests. This evidence should have a strong impact on our assumptions about the most ancient parts of our history. Yet it doesn't, and the many valuable lessons we could be learning from a more honest assessment of our own species' history are being held hostage by an establishment hell-bent on never admitting defeat and on protecting their own positions of power. This evidence implies that something far more sophisticated was going on than just a hard-working, loincloth-wearing primitive ancient civilization who had nothing better to do than spend all day banging rocks together in order to create ceremonial cemeteries. Which, if you have ever noticed, is exactly how the history books depict this work. Personally, I always laugh when I see images like these. The evidence for advanced tools and the precision we find in the most ancient of structures and objects implies some sort of function well beyond the capabilities of the dynastic Egyptian civilization was the result of all of this work. There is one more aspect of Old Kingdom sites that I want to briefly, at least as briefly as I'm capable of, cover in this video. And that is something that has a direct relationship to some sort of function on these ancient sites. There is evidence for an extensive infrastructure of channeled blocks having been installed in the subfloor level across many Old Kingdom pyramid sites. These are also known as U-shaped blocks, and they are often made from limestone, alabaster, or quartzite, although other stone types may well have been used. The best example is at Abu Sia, where much of this infrastructure is still visible in situ, beneath the quarried remnants of basalt and granite that made up the floor. If you ever have the chance to visit this site, take note at the very bottom of the causeway, commonly where you enter it, and look down. You will find exposed channeled blocks that once ran beneath the full length of the causeway. As you walk around the ruins of the great courtyards of Sahure and Nusara, you can follow the infrastructure of channeled blocks installed into the level beneath the pavement. In one spot, a quartzite channeled block appears to exit into a well-formed quartzite bowl. On other Old Kingdom sites, there are only a few solitary channeled blocks to be found, the barest remnant of what once was here, with the rest long since quarried and removed, along with the pavements and structure they once ran beneath. We can find a few channeled blocks at Saqqara, again in an area that ran beneath a basalt pavement. Here is a single solitary channeled block lying out in the desert of Dashur, near the mighty Bent Pyramid. There are but a couple of blocks still visible in the complex of the Middle Pyramid at Giza. Keith Hamilton, the author of the many excellent and highly recommended Layman's Guides to Ancient Structures, pointed out to me in an email that these blocks are also found at the 4th Dynasty structure known as the Mastabat El Faraun. In each case, these channeled blocks were originally beneath the floor tiles of pavements and even causeways, and they seem to have been run all over the place, with features like bends and Y-joints and junctions still in evidence. What was their purpose? What were they for? Could they have been used for liquid? Were they used to house something like copper piping? Or to serve as a conduit for something running beneath the heavy and thick stone pavements? One thing seems certain, they cannot have been ceremonial, as in the original structures they would not have been visible at all. This fact alone screams function, and the only explanation I've ever heard given by mainstream archaeology is as a sewer system. Really? Do you think they were installing toilets in their funeral temples? Did the mummies need to occasionally get out of their granite boxes and drop a deuce? Did the royal dung need to be transported in blocks made from alabaster or quartzite? Or does this look like an appropriate collection point for Pharaoh's morning movements? Do not go in there. Woo! Naturally, I jest, but there really isn't any other explanation for it. These U-shaped blocks and this infrastructure just isn't ceremonial, as explained here by my friend and expert guide Yusuf Awan, in reference to the U-shaped blocks at Saqqara that happened to be made out of Egyptian alabaster. Hey, I'm going to bring this stone from a different, far destination to bring it over here. This is the Middle East. It's going to be for something decoration. Right. But if it's something functional, then it's a different story. 
because if, it, if I brought it from far away for something functional and decorational, then I will still have it appear above the ground. But if it's going to be hidden, then what difference is it going to make? Hmm? If I use the, any other type, granite or limestone or anything, to have these water channels, yeah. these water channels, if they are running over the entire thing, they need to be entire thing. So, what can we conclude here? Once again, we have strong indications of functionality and of advanced capability in some of the oldest known structures on Earth. Once again, we have an example of the inverse technological progression logic that somehow the most advanced and hardest forms of stonework took place in the earliest periods of known ancient civilizations. It's a point that I've made several times, but according to mainstream history, the Old Kingdom was the first period of ancient Egypt, yet it is also the Old Kingdom that was somehow responsible for its greatest works, including the mighty pyramids of Giza, Maidum, and Dashur, as well as the crafting of the most megalithic stonework, massive blocks made from literally hundreds of thousands of tons of some of the hardest forms of natural rock, things like granite, basalt, diorite, and quartzite. Later periods of Egypt were, quite simply, not able to replicate these works. In fact, they commonly pillaged and quarried from the Old Kingdom structures in order to build their own. Even the famous dream stele that sits between the paws of the Sphinx, the one that tells the story of Thutmose IV, this was chiseled into a recycled piece of granite that was taken from an Old Kingdom structure. Based on all observable history, and our own civilizations rise to technological sophistication. This immediate appearance of advanced capability in the Old Kingdom, right out of the Stone Age, no less, and then the subsequent loss of capability in later periods, runs contrary to everything we know about how civilizations progress. It just doesn't make sense, and it's one of the most glaring logical inconsistencies in the mainstream story of history. While we're at it, the same can be said for the megalithic cultures of South America, Mainstream history in this region tells a similar story of backwards logic, but in much shorter time frames. The Inca civilization, supposedly responsible for the megalithic work in Cusco and the Sacred Valley of Peru, also appear to have had an immediate capability to do massive and precise stonework, with the biggest and best work being on the lowest or earliest layers of architecture. Yet they also seem to have lost this capability, and not over centuries or millennia, but rather in just decades, regressing to a form of very primitive stonework, that which is found on top of the huge megalithic walls in places like Sacsayhuaman and Olante Tambo. No better example of this can be found than an examination of the courtyards of the successive High Inca rulers, of which there were only 13. The first eight rulers created megalithic courtyards, but the 9th through 13th could only manage courtyards built from small local stone. Why do you think this is? Do either of these civilization narratives really make any sense? Or is it more likely that the advanced works were discovered and inherited by the known ancient cultures? We should always remember that we're looking at the skeletons of many cultures, of many civilizations, and we should always be open-minded and embrace evidence where we can find it. Sadly, though, this doesn't seem to be the case for our current crop of establishment archaeologists. That said, if I've learned anything from developing this channel, it's that there is certainly hope for the future. The next generation of archaeologists seem much more open-minded, and there are many excellent independent researchers investigating various aspects of our history, and we're all connected through the internet, allowing the fast dissemination of new ideas. The history impacting evidence coming from adjacent fields of science, things like the human genetic timeline, the climate history of the planet with the Younger Dryas, and further technological proof for a lost ancient global civilization is only getting stronger and stronger. One day, I do believe that the works of people like Graham Hancock and Christopher Dunn will be vindicated and valued for what they are. After all, it's a constant of science, exemplified by historical figures like Copernicus and Galileo with the heliocentric model, Ignaz Semmelweis with germ theory, and J. Harlan Bretz with catastrophism, that new scientific discoveries come from the fringe, and are generally opposed by the establishment, only to be later proven correct. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching.
right, well, there it is. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I uh, enjoyed putting it together. It's been quite a grind for the last few weeks trying to put this video together. I wanted it to be something like my video about the tube drills, which is a real, you know, a real deep dive into uh, a particular aspect of, of machining and, and a particular category of evidence that we can find on some of these Old Kingdom sites. So yeah, and it, it's also something that hints at some sort of functionality. Uh, so it's, you know, I know I've covered some of these topics a little bit in the past, but I wanted to specifically kind of deep dive into the saw cuts and then also talk about those channeled blocks that seem to run underneath the floor levels. They're just really mysterious to me as to why they would have been used for any decorational purpose. I think that uh, it really screams at something functional. So speaking of something functional, uh, stick around after this little segment here where I'm going to thank a few people uh, because I'm going to kind of do a little postscript here talking about a very strange feature uh, in, in the stone itself. It's something that I've seen at Abu Sir, also at Karnak Temple. Uh, that kind of also seems to, it could seems like it could possibly be related to something functional on these sites. A little bit of bonus footage at the end of this, so stick around for that. But before we get to that footage, I do want to take a few minutes here to thank a few specific people and just in general say a big thank you to everybody that does support my work through that value for value model. Uh, it really is the only way that I'm able to spend the time that it takes to research and make these videos. I also want to acknowledge and thank several people that kind of go above and beyond in terms of supporting the channel. And I try to do that by issuing both executive producer credits and associate executive producer credits. These are real credits. They work just the same as, as Hollywood credits. They'll work wherever such credits are accepted. I know some people like to put them on their LinkedIn or on their resume. And of course, I'll vouch for them too. If anybody asks questions, if they want to come back to me, I'll, I'll happily vouch for these credits. So starting with the executive producer credits, and these are for people that have supported my work in amounts of $200 or more. Uh, I've got a few people here to thank. Chris Partney. Uh, Chris came in with, I think, a, a $300 donation on Twitch. It kind of rocked me back in my chair. I was I was doing a Twitch stream and we were chatting away uh, and he, he sort of dropped a donation on me. So thanks very much. Chris Partney, CH Partney, looking forward to chatting with you. I do stream fairly regularly, at least three days a week over on Twitch. You can find all the links for those below. Uh, along the same lines, Antonio Kasseljevic, <laughs> Antonio Kass Antonio Kasseljevic, sorry, Ant Kass, uh, also through Twitch. He, uh, right after Chris actually dropped $200 on me in that stream, like I was, uh, you guys kind of, made me sit back in silence for a little while after that. I was trying to process it. So thank you very much for that also, uh, Antcast. Greatly appreciated. And again, looking forward to seeing you in more of the streams going forward. Northern Investments, hit me up on PayPal for $200. Thanks very much, Northern Investments. He wrote that he's been watching my videos for some time now, and it's about time that I paid you back for all the enjoyment you have brought me through your channel. Your work is impeccable, and I would encourage others who enjoy your channel to contribute as well. This is the sort of content we need for deeper understanding of our past. Good on you, mate, and thank you. Thank you very much, Northern Investments, for that support. It's greatly appreciated. I do want to thank a couple of people that have hit me up with some, some, some tips uh, in higher amounts over on Subscribestar. This is from earlier in the year. Uh, City. That's all the information I have, but uh, my, my supporter City on uh, Subscribestar has hit me up with two separate $100 tips. Thank you very much, City. I uh, hope you enjoy the credit. If you want to send me an email with your name or anything to, to put on this video, I'll happily do it. And also in the executive producer list, Neo Hippie. Uh, thank you very much for all the support over time, Neo Hippie. Uh, she is one of my mods on my Discord. You can find links to that below. Also my Twitch channel and a constant supporter who is always gifting subs and, and cheering bits and just in general kind of helping me out quite a bit with everything that's going on in my channel. So thank you very much, Neo Hippie. Moving on to the associate executive producers and these are folks that have supported me in amounts of $100 or more up to 200. Starting with Mark Taylor, who came in with $150, a little more actually 94 cents uh, on PayPal. And Mark wrote that, uh, hey Ben, congratulations on the continued quality of this site, all your visuals and discussion points for how things might've happened, cheers. Thanks very much, Mark, greatly appreciate that. Uh, and yeah, thanks for the support. Also, and this is another one from uh, Subscribestar a little earlier in the year, Gina C, who said, keep up the great work, Ben. And Gina is a subscriber on Subscribestar. She has also hit me up with $150 in tips over there. So thanks very much, Gina. It's greatly appreciated. Oh, I'm going to struggle with this name. Holy crap. Gregors Bozek uh, through PayPal. Uh, $100. Gregors uh, says, uh, keep up the good work. 
Uh, thank you very much, Greg Horse. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much for the support. And along the same the same lines on PayPal, Frederica Russell came in uh, with $100 over PayPal and said, thanks for sharing your expeditions with me. Uh, it's my pleasure. I hope you enjoy them. There's plenty more to come. Uh, I do have trips coming up this year. It's going to be a busy few months for me going forward. Uh, going back to Peru in a couple of weeks here. Then I'll be up in the Channeled Scablands with Randall Carlson at the Contact at the Cabin event in September. I think there may be a seat or two left on that. If anyone's interested, you can find details for that at contactatthecabin.com slash Carlson. And then October, we're going back to Egypt, back on an Uncharted X2. I've got a couple surprise guests coming with us for this that I don't think is common knowledge. Also, some surprise um, events and special permissions that we're doing on this trip that isn't on the itinerary. It's going to be a good time. I'm also in the, in the early stages of planning something for next year for people that can't make October that are interested. Another name that I'm going to struggle with a little bit here, uh, and my apologies, Thomas, uh, if I murder your name, but Thomas Sezuniski. Uh, from through PayPal, dropped hundred dollars and said, "Love the channel. Please keep up the great work." So thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope you, I hope you enjoy the content going forward as well. Thanks for the support. Also, one other thing that I wanted to let everybody know about: if you go back a few videos in one of these postscripts, you might remember a game called Rebellion Gaia. Uh, I had voiced the lines for one of those characters in those games. It was quite an interesting experience doing that. Uh, and it's uh, the game has now been released, Rebellion Guy, for PC. It's very much an, an, indie, an indie game that is aimed at kind of the ancient explorer. It kind of is very much in the wheelhouse of topics uh, that you might be interested in if you're interested in this channel and, and the other channels like it. Uh, if you go to store.rebellionguy.com and use the promo code BEN, I will get a, a small cut of those sales for those. So it's one way to support the channel and to get a game. And you can find it at store.rebellionguy, which is R E B E L L L I O N G A I A dot com, and the promo code is Ben. So, as promised, I do want to talk a little bit about some speculation around the actual functional nature of these sites and what I think happened, and also share with you a, just a really strange feature that I found on, on a couple of these sites. And that feature is, is some of this stone, the basalt stone, particularly at Abu Sia, uh, as well as some granite stone that we found at Karnak. Has, it's, it's almost as if it's melted or it's, it's flaking. Not, not melted, but it's, it seems to have undergone some sort of molecular change to the point where it's crumbling and it's flaking off. And you'll see that in, in this footage here. This isn't something that is really a natural effect for this type of stone, or at least not unless it's kind of been exposed to, to the sunlight for, for millions and millions of years. But we're talking about cut blocks here, and I really don't think they've, they've been cut that long ago. So it's not something that should have happened to this stone by being out in the sun. Uh, it's kind of a really weird effect. And you see it in a number of different places. The best examples, as I said, Abu Sia as well as uh, at Karnak. There's a whole section at Karnak where all this granite is just cracked and crumbling. It's almost as if it's undergone a transformation from the inside out. And, and this is a real interesting thing for me. I'd love to know or see somebody do some sort of molecular analysis to, to take a much closer look at this stone to see what's happened because to me it, it kind of screams at some sort of functionality. Uh, something that, that I've noticed on a lot of these really old kingdom sites is that you see the same combinations of stone. Uh, it's not just these three but these are the three primary types of stone that you'll see which is basalt, granite and limestone. In a lot of places you'll see limestone that's been cased in granite or cased in basalt. Uh, for example the Valley Temple is limestone cased in granite and up at Abu Sia, the channels where we see this flaking basalt uh, it's it's limestone that's been cased in basalt and in fact where the basalt's flaking that was the face that was kind of on the limestone so it's it's a very sort of interesting effect and to me it hints at a possibility of some sort of functionality maybe it's repeated heat cycling uh, I don't know there's there's a those types of stones those three types of stones also happen to have uh, different properties when they're tested with high voltage uh, electricity and this is I've got a video where we did some testing on this I think with like 500,000 volts going through and it's kind of I, I don't really know what to make of it uh, but it's an interesting video it's a, it was an interesting experiment there's there's a link to that video down below that you can go and watch if you haven't seen it yet uh, but in general to me I think that my, my gut feeling is is that these sites were all functional at some point in the past now, what function that is, I, I really don't know. Could have been manufacturing, could have been some form of energy production. I do think that Chris Dunn's theory with the Giza power plant is probably our best modern 
effort at trying to explain in detail a functional purpose for some of these uh, ancient structures. Uh, but at the same time, I also don't think that we have really the perspective or, or the technological understanding uh, to really frame up what we're looking at in, in any real detail or, or enough capability to understand it yet. And kind of the example I'd use is if, you know, you took something like a smartphone uh, that was just turned off and you went back in time 100, 200 years and say this was dead, you know, the battery on it was dead, the people back there would, wouldn't have any context to be able to understand what it is. It would just be this shiny black thing that cracks if you smash it and, you know, didn't do anything. But, but you and I, although we couldn't make one of these, you know, we know what it is. We, we understand what a touchscreen is. We understand what wireless networking is. We know what the camera does, the microphone. We understand the capability and the technology that makes up this device and therefore we can put it in a context and understand it from a technological perspective. I think when we're looking at some of these sites, I don't, I just don't think we have the perspective to understand them, which is why I'm always on about we should be testing them and looking at them with an open mind uh, because we might stand to learn something. Um, I might be wrong, but I think that's probably the best uh, an, a way to approach the problem and try to, 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 get, to a, a, get closer to the truth, if you like, because I don't think these sites were purely ceremonial. Now, the other thing I'd say is that I don't think that it was the dynastic Egyptians that were operating or, or using the function of these sites, but I do think that they were connected and had, had some memory or understanding of the times where they were. And in fact, this is something they themselves talk about. Uh, they, have, they talk about Zeptepi, the time when the gods walked the earth. They also talk about the Shemsu Hor. There's a period of time before the dynastic Egypt period where the followers of Horus, the Shemsu Hor, these semi-divine advanced beings with all sorts of magical, myst mysterious capabilities, walked the earth and, and, and created some of these sites. So they created some of their mythos and legends that the dynastic Egyptians remembered. Now, you know, they, anything that we don't understand, and this is a natural thing, we just palm it off to, to magic. But ultimately, you know, that's, it's science. You know, we just, as science advances, the, the boundary between mysticism and magic goes back with it. So as our understanding progresses, the, the domain of the unknown kind of shrinks along with it, and we don't call stuff magic anymore, we just call it science. So I think with the dynastic Egyptians, they may have had some connection to this, some memory of it, some understanding of it. And actually, the Manu Seifazada's new book, Under the Sphinx, also shows that there may be some, some truth to this with some advanced understanding that came from the earliest parts of the dynastic Egyptian civilization, but that they themselves didn't really comprehend. And I think that's what we're seeing at a lot of these places. They had some memory, some some cultural remnants of what happened before and they probably tried to capture the power of that through ceremony uh, through ritual and by doing so on these sites they probably turned them into what they most likely were for the dynastic egyptians which were temples but their original purpose i don't think was was that i think it was some sort of functional purpose and the best chance we have of, of understanding that is is really looking at these with an open mind to all of the technological evidence for it so this crumbling stone, it's something I intend to explore a little bit more in a future video, uh, but I wanted to give you a sneak peek at it and just kind of throw a few thoughts out there about, about what I think some of the possibilities for it might be. It's certainly an area that I intend to investigate further. Uh, but other than that, I really do hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you all in the next one. Cheers.